we went early to talk about high resolution, 12 CO and 13 CO maps of the surface. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, as stated, I'm here to talk to you about the high resolution 12 CO and 13 CO maps I made of the surface of the cloud. I'll also point out that my advisor, John Peggy, was kind enough to be here and said, come from. Having a hard time hearing you. Um, the goal of my project is to use two isotopes of carbon monoxide, 12 and 13 CO, as traces from molecular hydrogen. Now, H2 is what all star, stars initially form out of, and so we are looking at the current and future star formation going on in the surface. It might be interesting, why don't we just look at H2? Well, in the submillimeter bands, H2 is a rotationally symmetric molecule, and so it doesn't have any radio emission. Instead, we have to use another isotope, uh, another molecule to trace it, and the second most abundant one is carbon monoxide. Um, it has very strong molecular emission lines, and its excitation temperature is 10 Kelvin, which is approximately what you assume for um, molecular cloud temperatures. Specifically, we use the J equals 2 to 1 transition, which corresponds to 230 and 220 gigahertz for 12 and 13 CO. Um, to give you a brief overview of molecular cloud, they're very large, up to tens, hundreds of light years across. Um, and they're primarily composed of H2, which is why Bill Gary would refer to them as stellar nurseries. Shown here is a plot of some molecule emission lines you can expect to see in a given molecular cloud. I'll point out the 13 CO line that we looked at and the 12 CO line. And you notice that as a function of intensity, they're so intense that they actually go off the scale of the plot, which further makes sense why they're such a good line to look at. We took our data with the Heinrich Hertz submillimeter telescope on Mount Graham. And I'll just point out that it's at an elevation of 3,300 meters or about 10,000 feet. This is important because the water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere absorbs out light with a wavelength near one millimeter. And so if you want to do submillimeter astronomy, you either have to put your telescope in space or you put it on a high enough mountain peak that's relatively dry and the water vapor is negligible. Uh, our data consists of 1.2 square degrees on the sky it has 38 or 39 10 arc minute by 10 arc minute fields shown as black boxes. Um, also, the, the variations of blue that you see correspond to the RMS of our data. Uh, to reduce the data, I used two spectral line imaging uh, packages, class and myriad, and then applied basic reduction techniques to subtract off instrumental noise and background scale. This is our 12 CO reduced data. Um, what these are, these are intensity maps at velocity slices. So for instance, the top left panel shows the intensity of 12 CO molecular isotopes at moving at three kilometers per second. And then as we move through the spectrum, from three kilometers per second to seven kilometers per second, and from eight to 12, uh, you see the distribution change. Now I'll point out two interesting features about this. The first is that in this top region, it's called the serpent's core, it's known as the most active region of serpents. And so it makes sense that the most intensity we see comes from that region. Also, you notice that as we move through the spectrum, around seven <coughs> kilometers per second through eight kilometers per second, the average intensity of the field reaches a maximum. And if you look at an average spectra for the 12 or 13 CO lines, this is where the mean intensity reaches a maximum. So this makes sense. Uh, these are the same data I just showed you, except those are data cubes. Here, I'm plotting the 12 and 13 CO integrated intensity maps. 12 CO here and 13 CO on the row. If you take a, a pixel in one of the data cubes and you sum the intensity values across the entire spectrum, you get a total intensity value. Plotting that at all spatial locations gives you the integrated intensity map. Um, these are specifically useful because if you take the ratio, that is, you divide the 12 CO by the 13 CO map, you get an approximation for the optical depth of the cloud or the column density. Um, to save you some radiation transfer arguments for what this quantitatively implies, I'll just say that when you see a line ratio of 1.6, which corresponds to this gray color on the color scale, um, that spatial location has become so jam-packed with molecules that you can no longer see through. And so where we see this transition from uh, gray into white, those are the most column dense regions of the gas and where we expect future stars to form. Um, you'll notice that yes, there's some of this region in the most active region, but most of it actually extends down below that. And so there we're actually seeing the star formation 
um, evolving to lower regions in the surface plane. Um, here I show you what I've already shown you with the 12 and 13 scale integrated intensity maps, except that now I'm overlaying locations of young stellar objects as the blue dots and 1.1 millimeter sources that Kevin also mentioned as the green. Young stellar objects are already formed stars. 1.0 millimeter sources are simply, there's no star there, but they're just locations where there's cold, dense gas, where you'd also expect stars to form. Um, the YSOs were obtained with the Spitzer Space Telescope data, 1.1 millimeter sources from the Caltech Bolo Cam camera. You'll notice that the YSOs are mainly concentrated in the Serpent's Core region, which you expect. There's something like over 300 stars already formed in that active region whereas the 1.1 millimeter sources are more evenly distributed throughout the planet. <clears throat> Here I show a very similar plot. I'm now, instead of point sources of 1.1 millimeter object, I'm showing the extended contours of the 1.1 millimeter depth. And what these contours in yellow are showing is the um, most uh, column dense regions of cold gas. I'm overlaying that on peak temperature maps of 12 and 13 CO, and 12CO is intrinsically measuring the temperature of the cloud, whereas the 13CO is measuring the column density of the CO gas. And so you expect then that the Bolo Cam and 13CO data should agree, which you actually observe here. This is an interesting region, which I could explain later if I had more time, but I don't. Um, if you take a, a 12CO integrated intensity map and you simply break it and stretch it high, you immediately see this feature here. What this is is a bipolar gel. So what this is, if you have a young star, it has an accretion disk around it. And as material falls into the star from an accretion disk, to conserve energy and angular momentum, the star has to emit highly charged um, and energetic particles at high velocities perpendicular to the accretion disk. So what these do is they ionize hydrogen, split the hydrogen apart, ionize the electron, and you can actually form a, a front or a bubble of carved out from the molecular gas that then shocks the material, heats up the outside material, creates pressure instabilities, and ultimately forms more stars. Looking at our data to where these turbulent regions occur infers the cloud dynamics. In summary, we map nearly the entire surface of molecular cloud, 1.2 square degrees at a high resolution. We calculate the H2 column density to derive extinction mass, other goal-oriented parameters of the cloud from the 12 CL and 13 CL temperature and column density values we get. Comparing our data to the YSO and 1.1 millimeter sources gives us the current and future star formation of serpents. Looking for bipolar jets or the region of turbulence allows us to see how the cloud dynamics in serpents is coupled to the star formation. Thank you. Supposedly measuring the column density, 
it's, it's matching the Bilcam data pretty well. And then you get to this region here. And yes, there's, there, there is a mission there, um, but it's more like a starless core. So that star is in the process of forming, um, but it ha it, it's, it's not hot enough yet for the, the CO to form there. It actually freezes out and you, you don't detect it. So that'd be one instance where the, the difference in the, in the ratios would immediately tell you something. 